Welcome back to the Reading and Writing Podcast. My guest today is D. Eric Mykrantz, author of the Reincarnationist Papers, which is the basis for the new major motion picture, Infinite, starring Mark Wahlberg. Eric, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Jeff. It's my pleasure to be here. Did I actually, I'm just wondering, did I get the name of the the title wrong? Because I'm having, I, I'm looking at my notes. Is it is no, it no, no, you got it right. Yeah, the reincarnation papers. Okay, yep. okay. So I'll edit that out. So um, if someone hasn't yet heard about your novel, The Reincarnationist Papers, how would you describe the novel? So uh, I would describe the, no- the novel is uh, sort of a first-person discovery uh, book. It's uh, about a man, who a, a troubled young man who lives in Los Angeles, and he's troubled by complete memories of two past lives. And I mean, he remembers languages, skills, all the experiences, the loves, the losses, complete recall. And he thinks that he's alone in this world and that his existence is unique until he accidentally stumbles upon a woman who is just like him. And then she turns his world completely upside down by introducing him into a secret society of others who were just like them, who have been associating with one another for centuries and have been sort of quiet drivers to history behind the scenes. And do you remember the original idea or impetus that led you to writing the reincarnationist papers? Uh, I do, Jeff. It was actually, uh, it was actually two things. And number one is, and I know you're going to nod your head when you hear this, you know, that saying that we've all heard, oh my gosh, if I only knew when I was 18 or 20, what I know now when I'm 30 <laughs> or 40 or 50, right, I would have made these different decisions or better choices. And so I I basically took that to its extreme through the idea of being able to um, uh, have knowledge of past lives and have that wisdom. So instead of, you know, if I only knew, you know, when I was 30, what, you know, at, at, at 18, what I know when I'm 30, imagine a character who was, oh, if I only knew at 18, what I knew when I was essentially 360 years old for, you know eight lifetimes. Right. And I thought, wow, that'd be really, that would be really interesting characters to write about and hopefully really interesting characters to read about. So that was one. The second Jeff is that I actually have three really short memories that don't belong to me (laughs) and they predate me. The newest one is like 1940s. The oldest one is probably 1860s, 1870s, but they're first person. Just like all the other memories that I have, they're as real as any of the other memories that I've had. I've had them since I was a child, and I don't really know what to do with them. So I sort of took that to its extreme as well, as as writers will sometimes do. And I felt, what would it be like if you could remember everything? And then the marriage of those two ideas together was the start of the Reincarnation's Papers. And had you written fiction before you sat down to write the Reincarnation's Papers? Uh, I'd written short fiction before, uh, you know, uh, 2000, 4,000, 5,000 words that had been picked up by a few journals, uh, you know, back in the nineties, but no, this was actually like the first big thing that I'd written. And, and do you remember the, the, do you remember, was there like a specific day? Was it something that you were kind of noodling around on and it, it ended up becoming a novel? What was that process like since you had only written short fiction before? So I, I can remember, uh, I am visualizing it right now, Jeff, that I was actually driving uh, on the highway here in Denver, Colorado. I live in Denver. And uh, I, I, you know, I'd, I'd had the memories, the, the other three memories that are not mine for a long time. And then that's when I I was in the car toying with the idea of, you know, if I only knew then what I know now, and then what would that be like over centuries? And that's when I realized, you know what, pull the car over, hit the next exit, start taking some notes, writing this stuff down. That was the absolute instant that it started. 
And what was your writing process when you were working on the book? Did you, after you made those notes, as you just described, after you pulled the car over, did you sit down after that and outline the novel extensively? Or did you just make enough notes to kind of dive in and see where the narrative led you? So, um, the, yeah, and, and this gets to sort of the the question of architect versus gardener or pantser versus plotter. I'm very much a an architect or a plotter type. Uh, so I did some outlining, but the first things that I did are I actually wrote a couple of the chapters from the middle of the book that are historical flashbacks where we explore one of the characters that Evan, the main character in the book, encounters as he meets Poppy, who is just like him and recognizes him for what he is and then introduces him into the Cognomina, which is the society of the other reincarnationists. Uh, I actually wrote a couple of the flashback chapters first that that explore some of the other reincarnationists in their other lives uh, and place them in historical context. Those are actually the most fun chapters for me to write, and they're I sort of use them as as sort of uh, you know fence posts or guideposts, if you will, to sort of structure parts of the book. And those are the ones that I always almost always end up writing those first. And so that was the first ones, uh, first ones that I wrote. And it actually helped me, Jeff, because I could actually write those more like standalone short stories as historical flashbacks. And then just be, you know, just being aware of the character development that I wanted to portray in those flashbacks for those characters that we would be writing about in the present day, hanging on the second book. Well, as writers who follow Hollywood know, there are literally hundreds of novels that are optioned by uh, optioned by either actors or um, studios and screenplays are written and the movies never happen. So I'm just curious, can you give us a little bit of detail about how the movie deal uh, came about? Uh, absolutely. And, and you're absolutely right. I was warned at at least two points along the curve of those exact odds that you're talking about. But the story actually goes back a little further than that. Uh, you know, the, the reincarnationist papers was, was re-released by Blackstone publishing in 20, in May of 2021. And it's available in print ebook and audio. But I, I originally had self published this novel back in 2009 after I tried to find an agent for it, I actually had an agent, but we, we couldn't really get the book picked up anywhere. But every person that I ever shared the book with really loved the book, really loved the universe, really loved the concepts in it. And so I knew the book was good. So what I did is I borrowed a, a page from my day job, Jeff, and my day job is working in Silicon Valley. And one of the things that we do in software development is we use a technique called crowdsourcing. And that's where we, you know, issue a goal to a lot of people who are using a software or customers of the, of a software. And we ask them, Hey, what, what new features would you like to see in the software? What would you like to see us enhance? And I did the same thing with my book. Uh, and, and what I did is I put a reward on the first page of that self published edition that was the agent's commission to any reader who read the book, loved it and would introduce it to a Hollywood producer who would give me an option and adapt it into a major motion picture. And then I sold as many copies as I could, which is not a lot when you're an unknown self-published author. But Jeff, this, 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 this harebrained idea actually worked because there was an assistant to a Hollywood director that actually found a copy of the Reincarnationist Papers in a hostel in Nepal and read it and loved it and emailed me and said, hey, is this reward still available? Because I would love to see this thing made into a movie. And his name was Rafi. And Rafi and I set up an agreement. And Rafi, it took Rafi several years. Uh, it took him four years to get the first option. And then after the first option, it took three years for that production company to get a screenwriter to adapt the novel. And in 2017, it was sold to Paramount. And about a year later, uh, Antoine Fuqua and Mark Wahlberg got attached to the project. They started shooting it in 2019. And so that's the, that's the long, crazy story <laughs> of how the reincarnationist papers became infinite starting Mark Wahlberg. That's, that's an amazing story. 
Do you think other authors might try the 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 uh, finder's fee? Uh, yeah, you know, it, I, I they're they're certainly welcome to, and I actually have a copy of the actual reward that I used on my website, ericmicrans.com. Um, and they're welcome to copy it. If they do copy it, Jeff, I, I do wish they would uh, sort of title it the Micrance Reward. That would be sort of a, a <laughs> nice uh, a nice homage there. But, but I mean, this gets to the point of crowdsourcing, right? If people like your stuff and you get your stuff in front of readers, uh, you know, that there, there's, been a, there's been a precedent of other authors who have used cancer. So many lives are touched by cancer. In fact, one in two men and one in three women will be diagnosed with cancer. At the American Cancer Society, we're on a mission to free the world from cancer. It's a big mission, driven by little things like a ride to treatment, a free place to stay, a 24-7 helpline. But these little things are really the big things. Because to a cancer patient and their family, they're everything. And every day we reach thousands of cancer patients who so desperately need these services. But we need your help to get these critical services to more people and families in need this holiday season. Go to cancer.org and join the fight against cancer. It takes just minutes to donate and help provide essential support to cancer patients and their families. Don't wait. More than one in three people will be diagnosed with cancer. Go to cancer.org right now and make a difference. Go to cancer.org. That sort of self-publishing, uh, you know, uh, way of, of, of aggregating readers and getting readers engaged with their work. I'm thinking of Andy Weir. I'm thinking of E.L. James, right? Um, sure. And then pretty soon you get enough readers and you'll get the attention of publishing professionals. Definitely. Well, what writing advice would you offer for those who are working on their own stories and novels? Um, <clears throat> get it in front of readers that are not related to you and are not your friends. Uh, because they'll tell you if the, if the work is commercial quality or not. And if you get good readers, right, they'll tell you if it's not commercial quality, what things need to be improved. Um, in, in, in my mind, right, the, you know, writing a book is a bit like, you know, forging a piece of steel, but you know, the, 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 the audience, the readers are like the, are like the anvil that you hammer against, right? They're the thing that actually you should be testing it against all the time to make sure that it's strong, that it's sharp, that it's, that it's functional. That's great. Are you working on a new novel now? Uh, I am. I just finished. It was, man. So today's Friday. I just finished it on Monday. The follow up to the reincarnationist papers. There, there, there'll be at least four books in that series, Jeff. The second book, tentatively titled The Cognomena Codex, uh, sent it to my agent on uh, Tuesday and he's reading it. And hopefully we'll have it in front of the publisher sometime in the next 30 days. And I'm going to be firing up another. The book three in the project, probably sometime in the in the later part of this year. That's great. Well, what novels or nonfiction books have you read recently that you enjoyed? The last uh, novel that I read was Nickel Boys by Colson Whitehead. Um, I love Colson Whitehead. I think that he and Cormac McCarthy are probably the the two best American writers today. Uh, I mean, the guy did one back to back Pulitzer prizes. Um, I just, I love the way that he writes. Uh, there are times when I read his work and I'm just like, Man, holy cow, guy's a magician. <laughs> uh, and the last nonfiction book that I've, I've read, I'm actually reading it now. It's, um, and man, I always get this guy's name wrong. Um, it's the immortality key, the history of the secret religion with no name by Brian Murareski, I believe is his name. Um, uh, and it's about, um, a Greek, an ancient Greek mystery cult that, uh, some of which, uh, was probably adopted into early Christianity. And I actually read that book as part of research for the Cognomena Codex, but I'm just really, uh, engrossed in the book right now. That's interesting. So where can people find you online if they'd like to learn more about you and your novel, the reincarnationist papers? So the best place is my website, ericmikranz.com. Uh, and that last name is M-A-I-K-R-A-N-Z. Um, if, if readers sign up for my reader newsletter, 
Um, after the first week, uh, I will email those the people that sign up a hidden chapter in the reincarnationist papers. Uh, this is one thing that I've done with the reincarnation papers. I actually have two hidden chapters there that are chapters that I build out a little bit after publication. Um, and these tend to be historical flashback chapters so they can get updates on the next books in the series there. They can get those exclusive hidden chapters there, but I'm also on Facebook, uh, Twitter. Um, I struggle with Instagram and I'm trying Jeff. Um, and I don't dance well enough to be on TikTok yet. That's great. Well, again, we've been speaking with Eric Mykrantz, author of the Reincarnationist Papers. As we discuss, it's the basis for the new major motion picture, Infinite, starring Mark Wahlberg. The novel is on sale now, so go buy a copy. And Eric, thanks for doing this interview. Jeff, it was my pleasure, and thanks for having me on the Reading and Writing Podcast. Great. Now, stay tuned for a brief excerpt from the audiobook of the Reincarnationist Papers, narrated by Bronson Pinchot and Michael David Axtell, available from Blackstone Publishing, wherever audiobooks are sold. The noose looked ridiculous. Fashioned from a braided extension cord, it was likely too stiff to be an effective neckbreaker anyway, and I would end up strangling in a flailing, pantomimed panic. The asymmetrical loop at the end hung off to the right like an elongated number six, and its bright orange color lent a circus air to the entire endeavor. Would it even hold my weight, wrapped around the cheap light fixture like it was? It's easy to write about it now, that I'd often thought about killing myself, that I'd thought specifically about how I might do it. Drowning, overdose, asphyxiation, immolation is a personal favorite. I've even talked about the virtues and pitfalls of different methods with strangers on the bus. Why would you do such a thing was always a popular response, but I think that is the wrong way to look at it. I've always thought the better question was, why not do such a thing? What prevents you from doing such a thing? Do you like it here that much? Are you in love? Do people depend on you being here? Did it never occur to you? Are you afraid? I am not afraid. If you knew you would come back, if you knew you would live again, not just believed it, but knew it, why would you not do such a thing? But I didn't put my neck into that noose, not out of fear, but out of courtesy, really, because this place, this type of desperate end would be too horrible to remember. That's the trouble with having a perfect memory. The benefit is that you remember everything that has ever happened to you. The drawback is that you can never forget anything that has ever happened to you. The former imparts wisdom, but the latter robs you of hope. I decided to write down this story with the certainty that I will look on it again, with different eyes in a different time, and remember who I'd been. I left Minnesota three years ago because I started to remember. I left to find myself, only to find myself here in Los Angeles. Nobody's exactly what they seem in L.A. Everyone has an ulterior motive for leading their everyday lives. No one's just a doctor or a student or a salesman. Instead, they're a doctor and an art collector, a student with an audition next week, a salesman with a screenplay. In this place, more than any other I've found, there is anonymity in being more than you seem. And that, more than anything else, explains why I landed here. It was still in the low 90s outside when I left for the club. When it's hot at night and there's no wind, all of downtown L.A.'s visceral smells hang thick in the air, assaulting you as you pass. But still, it felt good to be outside, anywhere but in that room. I'd been cooped up in my room for three days straight, knowing the management wouldn't put a padlock on the outside of the door if there was still someone inside. I had lived, if you can call it that, in the Iowa Hotel for five months, and every time I was even a day late with the weekly rent, those bastards put that same blue spray-painted padlock on my door. If you didn't pay the rent by the end of that week, they would remove the lock, along with all your possessions. That hadn't happened to me yet, but it was only four days away. 
Leo, the manager, was already scurrying through the drawer in search of the blue lock when I passed by the front desk on my way out. There was a line outside the Necropolis Club. It seemed there was always a line. Thankfully, the doorman let me in without waiting. I was supposed to meet Martin at midnight. It was 10.45 when I arrived. The once quiet Necropolis had been my bar of choice for the past year, but with one write-up in the L.A. Weekly, the amateurs started pouring in from as far away as Simi Valley and Chino. Footnote. The L.A. Weekly is an alternative local paper with club listings. But for all its newfound popularity, the bar itself hadn't changed. The Egyptian-themed club sat in an old movie theater, and all they did to modernize it was to remove the seats, level the floor, put bars along the front and back walls, and build a stage in front of the silver movie screen, which showed vintage films behind the bands. The bar tops along each wall were lit by blue-white neon underneath thick, frosted glass, making it look as if they served nothing but iridescent blue liquors to the patrons. The walls had been stripped clean, painted black, and covered in 20-foot-tall white bas-relief portraits of strange-looking Egyptian gods. Hello, Evan, a familiar voice said from behind the bar. Henry, I said, smiling at him as I took the last empty seat at the back bar. What can I get for you? Give me a beer. That'll be two bucks, he said, nodding to someone holding up an empty glass at the other end of the bar. I had less than a dollar on me. Run me a tab, will you, Henry? I'm going to be here for a while, I said, lighting a cigarette. Henry smiled and went down toward the man with the glass. By midnight, the place was buzzing. The second band of the night took the stage while an angry Godzilla silently destroyed 1958 Tokyo on the screen behind them. The dance floor seethed with motion that appeared in stop frames from the overhead strobe lights. I could see the door from my seat at the back bar. The doorman was still letting people in at 12.30. Hello, this is Discover, and we take customer service very seriously. We know that if you have a question or concern about your credit card, that's a serious matter, and you need to talk to a real person about it. So we offer around-the-clock access to seriously talented representatives in the USA. Again, it's a serious endeavor. The only funny thing about it is Bob. If you call us and Bob answers, you're in for a treat. Get 100% U.S.-based customer service and talk to a real person day or night. Discover exceptionally common sense hear that is that america cheering or a sausage patty sizzling to perfection it's time to cheer for egg mcmuffin and fresh cracked eggs at mcdonald's it's time to wake up to the aroma of freshly baked biscuits and treat yourself to a real honest to goodness morning meal breakfast it's on at mcdonald's now get any breakfast sandwich for just two bucks available only through the app Mobile order and pay available at participating McDonald's. McD app download and registration required.